Welcome. My name is Falcon. I'm the senior partner of the House of Night Falcon. I will be your presenter tonight. Assisting me is J.D. Malazzo, a senior photographer with the House of Night Falcon and our chief operating officer. On behalf of DxO and Night Falcon, we are pleased to welcome you to our seminar tonight. J.D. will be fielding your questions during the course of the presentation. I'm going to take you through the basics of DxO Optics Pro version 7.1. This is an amazingly rich application, so it may not be possible for us to cover absolutely everything tonight. There will be further webinars in the future in which we will cover more specific options and various features that we will not be able to get through tonight. Let's begin by looking at the user interface. You will see that there are three tabs, Organize, Customize, and Process. <clears throat> Currently in Organize mode, I am looking at my D drive, my data drive, and I'm about to select a folder with images that we're going to work with tonight. That's in the sample directory. As soon as I click on samples, DxO will begin to read the images. <clears throat> you can see here that it has tagged 19. And here they are. They are arranged in sequence according to the number of each of the images. At the bottom, this is the film strip. And in the film strip, my various images are presented. And as you can see, when I hover over the image, it tells me the name, the location, and the format. It also tells me the ISO, the date of the shoot, and whether or not the flash was exposed, all of the appropriate EXIF information. At this point, I can preview any one of my images by simply dragging the film strip bar wherever I would like to place it. In this case, <clears throat> on a landscape image from New York City. I'm going to adjust that image by resetting it to the default. Bear with me for a moment. By clicking on any image at any point, I can see both the before and the after. That's true with every image in the bar. And the reason that I'm resetting these is that from the previous seminar earlier today, I've made some changes. <clears throat> and I'm now in the process of removing those changes so that you can follow me um, through the process of creating and working with images. In this mode, we have the ability to make the image larger. If we wish to expand, take a closer look and make a decision about whether it will be an image that we will work with. Um, I can also use the magnifying glass. When it's large, I can use the hand tool, if I wish, to drag it and manipulate it. One of the features that we're not going to spend a terrible amount of time on tonight, but one of the very rich features of how to organize my images, is the ability to create projects. In this case, I've created a project that has sample images, as you can see here, that we will be working with this evening. Let's look at the Customize option so that we can begin to explore the possibilities that are available to us. And by the way, I have the ability at any time to filter my images, which is what you're seeing here. Filtering is a very quick way to include or exclude numbers of photographs based upon how I decide their relative value. And the stars, by the way, appear on the left side of the image. That is controllable in the preferences. If I go to Edit and Preferences, you'll see here that I've turned on Processing Status, Image Name, Allow Processing, Ranking Stars, Module Status, <clears throat> rotation buttons, and the delete button. And in this case, I had turned off the five stars. I've added it back so that now I can see all of the images in the folder. And if I return now to my samples project, 
all the images that we're going to work on tonight. <clears throat> so let's very quickly begin moving into the customized section. When I highlight an image or click on it once, DxO very quickly brings that image up and you can see it switched to the finished image. This is an example of where we will take this image by the time we are finished working with it this evening. So if I click on it, there's the before and there's the after. Let's talk about how we got to this point and explore some of the possibilities that are open to us um, with Optics Pro. I'm going to scroll all the way to the top. Notice first here on the left, I'm going to switch um, to First Steps interface for the first stages of tonight's presentation. I have my histogram. I have my options arranged in a very clear and logical order. Light and color, corrections, film pack, which we're going to talk extensively about later on, are all laid out for me very quickly. It's important to note that by clicking on the arrow facing to the side, it when it points down, I have additional options that are avail available to me. Notice also that if I uncheck an option, I disable it. I'm going to check it and re-enable it. So to show you more clearly, I can go to distortion, uncheck it, and you can see the image actually changed. The same will be true throughout DxO. So very consistently, I can add and eliminate features that I wish to use when I'm customizing an image. A lot of changes have been made in version 7 and we're going to explore a number of those tonight. But let's begin by resetting this image back to its native form. And in DxO, it's possible at any given point to take an image back to the way it looked before you began working on it by right-clicking, going to apply a preset, and choosing one of the defaults, which you see here. And notice as I hover, I have a description and a recommendation, which tells me very quickly to what end I can use that default. Um, can you show the preferences option again? Okay. We have had a request uh, to look at the preferences option again, so we will return there. I'm going to, before we do that, <clears throat> shift back to advanced mode because there's some additional features that I'm going to use in the creation of this final image which are not available to me simply in the um, initial user mode. So let's go back under Edit and Preferences. My general preferences automatically check for updates which I strongly recommend that you leave on. Save settings in sidecar files automatically. Um, we will talk about that in just a second because that is for us a very important feature. Load setting from sidecars automatically, part of that same conversation. And now let's go to display. The important section here for us, at least in terms of what we are dealing with tonight, is down in here. And the ranking stars I'm pointing to right now. DxO always presents multiple ways to accomplish a task and it's possible to use DxO to process thousands of images if you so chose to with a minimal amount of intervention. We find that sometimes time consuming and when we come back from the average shoot where we might have as many as 1500 images, we try to restrict the number of images that we work on on a given time so that we can streamline our workflow. There are also some images that we just don't ever want to use. Ranking stars, again, what you see right here, gives us the ability to rank images so that we can lightbox a large number of images down to a smaller number of images very quickly. Okay, if there are no more questions about preferences, we will move back um, to where we were now. Let's talk a little bit about sidecars before we go any further. As you modify an image inside Optics Pro, all of those settings are collectible. Um, effectively, they are cached during the time that you're working on the image. A sidecar is a text file that is created by Optics Pro 
that takes all of those settings modified for that file and saves them. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, if you're like us and you go through a large volume of images, it helps to be able to go back to a specific image, pick up where you last left off editing it, tweak it according to your current needs, and process it again. We find that it greatly streamlines batch processing. Okay, so here we are. This is the Colony Hotel, South Beach, Miami. That's before the default correction. That is with the default correction. We do a considerable amount of architectural photography. And in an ideal world, um, a building distorted to that extent, um, as they say, tombstoned, is not at all ideal. And typically, if I wanted to shoot it, I would be up at the level of the letter N in a lift truck, which in this case the client could not afford. So I had to do what I could. Prior to DxO, and we've been using DxO Optics Pro since version 3.5, correcting visual distortion at this level would have been severely difficult and extremely time consuming within Photoshop or similar tools. And you'll see as we proceed through this example that this can be done very quickly and very effectively. Now, let's talk a little bit about the design of DxO and why it's different. We find that most converters are rather like walking into Walmart or Kmart or a large merchandise uh, retailer, walking into the shoe department, randomly grabbing a pair of shoes and putting them on your feet. They may or they may not fit. They may or they may not fit well. And in either case, it's not necessarily a pleasurable experience. Based upon some landmark work by Shannon and Nyquist in the early part of the uh, 20th century, DxO has developed a very sophisticated series of tests that are able to understand the unique optical and geometric properties of every camera body and every lens that they support. And by the way, um, the goal is to support 5,000 um, as of the end of this year, and I believe that they have actually been able to do that. The goal by the end of next year is 10,000 modules. One of the advances, by the way, in version 7 is that if your um, lens is not supported or if you wish to tweak the settings that are uh, used by DxO, uh, you are able to do so. But let's take this lens, um, the 24 to 105. Like most lenses, it's tack sharp in the middle. And as you move to the periphery, it becomes softer. The analysis which DxO does on each and every one of its supported lenses allows it to sharpen less in the middle and sharpen more on the edges so that the image quality is not compromised. Secondly, the ability to collect to correct distortion and vignetting, chromatic aberration, keystoning, and for those of you who do a fair amount of um, wedding and portraiture or corporate events, volume anamorphosis, uh, what we call the big head syndrome, is really unparalleled. Um, I'm sure if you've ever shot a long line of people, you know that the tendency is for the people at either end to appear distorted. Volume anamorphosis correction enables you to do that very effectively and very quickly. Okay, let's look at this image and let's talk about the problems that we wish to correct technically and then let's talk about the emotional experience we want to convey. Our biggest problem is going to be the keystoning. We also want to make sure that on a very beautiful sunny day in South Florida, we make this building pop. We make the colors really stand out the way they probably looked to the human eye. Now, this image was shot with a Canon 1DS Mark III. And if we look here at the EXIF information, you'll see that it was shot in 2008 at an ISO 100, 1 800, 1 of a second at f9 using Canon's 24 to 105. Not a bad camera, not a bad lens. But we want to make this a much more powerful image artistically and emotionally and we want to correct the distortion. It's extremely important that whatever you do, as you design your digital workflow, you do it consistently 
and you achieve a high degree of repeatability. So in the House of Night Falcon, we have a very set way of using DxO, and that typically begins by applying one of our presets. In the advanced seminars later this week, we're going to talk more about what a preset is, how a preset works, and the advantages of using a preset. Let's at this point simply say that a preset is a collection of all of the settings that you see here on the right for a very specific purpose. And in this case, we're going to start by applying a preset. If you notice where my mouse is pointing, each one of the folders that begins with the letter NF are folders that contain presets that were developed here at the House of My Falcon. I have one that's particularly interesting to me. Um, I call it Botanical Gardens No Grain. It was developed for an assignment at the New York Botanical Gardens. So I'm going to click on that and apply it. So before, after. And you can see now how much more powerful the image is to the eye. Now, if I want to be able to work that image even more, bring out some more of the effects that are possible before I correct the geometric distortion. I'm going to expand a number of my options so that we can go through them together and we can talk about the logic behind this preset and how we were able to deliver this image with the kind of visual power that it currently has. By the way, all of our presets and everything that we do with DxO makes extensive use of the film pack. I can also tell you that when Film Pack 1 came out, we were not believers, but it took a very short time for us to change our mind. And one of the photographs that we're going to look at shortly is an image which many of you saw in the email newsletter that went out from DxO of a young woman named Catherine. It was our work with Catherine that made us believers in Film Pack. Okay, the question is, can I show you how to go back to the DxO default, I'm sorry, can I show you to go back, how to go back to the DxO default very easily? Yes, in DxO, I need only right click, and notice the images that are a brighter white, those are the ones that are enabled, we'll talk more in a minute about copying, but notice I can very easily run up to here, where it says apply a preset. All of my presets and preset folders, for example, NF color is a preset folder. But if I choose DxO default version 2 and simply click on that, my preset is erased. All of the default settings have been restored. Okay. DxO also enables multiple undo. So I'm simply going to say undo, and that will return us to where we are. Now, before we actually begin manipulating this further and making some additional corrections, one of the most powerful features that DxO has is the ability to create a virtual copy. A virtual copy is identical to this image in every way. However, I have the ability to customize that image in a way that I um, that stands in contrast to this image. So, I'll show you what I mean. I right click, and notice here, I have an option that says create virtual copy. I'm going to click on that, and now I have a second image which has appeared next to it in the film strip, and when I click on it, you will see that it has the same appearance as the previous version, and the thumbnail has been updated to reflect that. Now, let's add another preset here. This time, I'm going to choose one of our HDR. Single image HDR um, goes back to version 6.5. DxO is looking at the ability at some point, possibly, of going with multi-image um, HDR. So let's just randomly choose one here. This is a sepia based on a lumograph 
film. And you can see, as I would expect, that it's going to be um, a very different look. And just for ease of use, let's go and pick one that's not that far off the map. This one is based on Astia film. So, as you can see here, I have much more purple in the sky, and here a much bluer. Okay, let's talk about some of the settings that we're using here before we actually correct the visual distortion and then work on some of the other images. All the images in this, in this project, by the way, were chosen because each one presents a very specific challenge that DxO has superior capabilities for addressing. That includes the portraits that you see here, as well as the architectural images. And I'm going to check my filter one more time and make sure that everything is turned on. Um, I apologize if I'm moving somewhat quickly. Um, it has been a long day and I've had more than my share of caffeine. Okay, so we are ready. Let's go back now. And let's talk about what we did here. We're going to slide all the way to the top. I think one of the um, misplaced opinions that we suffer in the world of photography is that film is objective. Um, film was no more or less objective than digital photography. And I think if you look at these two images side by side, you'll begin to get a sense of how changing the film type can have an impact on the emotional um, vision of a particular image. I say this because it's extremely important in our workflow to use film pack not only as a corrective for technical problems, but to be able to organize um, and gather together a particular uniform artistic experience for our viewer, depending upon what our client may want at a very specific time. So this particular preset, we're going to slide down and look at the film it's using, as you can see, is based on a generic Kodak Ektachrome 100 VS, and it is a color positive film. Now let's slide all the way back up. My preference is always to begin with exposure compensation. And here um, I have pulled it down just a little bit. And the reason I have done that is because with the Kodak Ektachrome film, that tends to richen and deepen the visual experience. In every DxO option, here under DxO Lighting, HDR, when you see Advanced Settings and the plus sign, if you click, it will reveal additional settings. In this case, I've set my correction to Strong. I have the ability to increase the intensity of the effect. As you can see, it lightens the sky. Or I can limit that effect. So in this case, I'm just going to say Edit Undo and Edit Undo again and I'm back to the default of my preset. Now, black point and white point. I've pulled my black point up to four. I'm going to drop it to two. And my white point to 247. I'm going to pick that up to 243. I'm sorry, 253. Why am I doing that? By setting the black point and the white point, I'm eliminating colors above and below them on a 256 point scale. This means that effectively there should be no absolute black points and no absolute white points. I've essentially bracketed the photograph in such a way that any areas where there is no detail, no information, will not be considered by DxO. Now, for me, one of the most powerful tools in the lighting section is the ability to alter the gamma. Um, particularly when it comes to architecture, I'm a fan of bright, intense colors, as you can see. And by altering the gamma, I alter that intensity of that experience. Shadow radius and preserving shadows, which is here set to 100%, gives me the ability to maintain or enhance, as I just did, 
the shadows on an image. That can come in handy on a portrait, as you'll see. But at the moment, let's leave it on the default. Likewise, with contrast, I have the ability to handle global and local contrast. I do want to point out, by the way, before we go much farther, if you look here where my mouse is pointing, um, there is a note that says zoom factors below 75% inhibit previewing of the following corrections, chromatic aberration, lens softness, and noise correction. Please keep that in mind. Generally speaking, I like to see the entirety of the image, so scrolling the image large enough to make that go away can be effective for viewing detail, but it doesn't allow me to get the entire experience. So we're going to scale back down, and you can see as we do that warning comes back. Okay, let's slide down now. Okay, vignetting automatic, which is my preference, or if I wish, um, I can manually make that adjustment, takes out the vignetting which occurs with some lenses, particularly in certain environmental conditions. Tone curve is a very powerful tool here. I have the ability to manipulate it in much the same way um, I can within Photoshop, except obviously since I'm working on a raw image without the distortion, that, require, that results um, from too much Photoshop work. Notice here that I've enhanced the green curve. I hope you can see that. Because here specifically, I wanted to pick up the green along the edges and the green of the palm trees. Now, I'm going to slide down further. White temperature. How can I alter or change my white balance, my light temperature in, in uh, DxO? It's really very simple. I can either use my sliders as follows. You can see I've made it much bluer. I've made it much warmer. I can adjust my hue. Or I can simply take my eyedropper, which is located there, or up here. and make the correction on the fly. Okay, uh, By unselecting the eyedropper tool, I bring it back. Now, what if I don't like what I just did? Very simple. I come back to my raw white balance, I click on our shot, and we're right back where we were. Vibrancy was new with version 5. The vibrancy can really boost the power of colors it is an intelligent tool so that it understands the difference between human flesh tones and the tones, for example, of a model's dress. And as you can see here, we have our color film and the uh, Kodak um, Ektachrome 100VS. I can also work off the camera body if I wish, color negative films, black and white films. We'll talk a little bit more about cross-process later. But for the moment, we're just going to leave it alone. A very important thing to keep in mind, everything inside Optics Pro can be customized. So for example, in this case, the intensity of my film is set to 100. I'll show you some presets that we've created where that's not the case. And if I want to remove some of the intensity of that effect, as you can see, I simply move the uh, slider to the left, or I move it to the right. Up to me, and again, edit, undo, edit, undo. Color modes, my contrast is set to 100, my saturation to 100. Um, similarly, I can manipulate these as I wish. Now, let's look at style and toning. I'm going to bring this back up for my next point to, to look better. I have a number of options which are interesting. For example, if I wanted this to look more like landscape, it automatically makes adjustments. If I want a generic black and white, and again, watch what happens when I control the intensity. We create what we call a color over effect 
in which it isn't a black and white, but it really isn't a color either. So I'm going to put this back, and this time I'm going to go to a sepia. And as you can see again, I have the ability to control the extent to which that effect has an impact on our photograph. So I'm going to put it back to as shot, put this back to 100. Filters, greatly enhanced with version 7.1. Notice the vast array. For example, if I apply a scion right here or an orange, which then I can control so that I can limit the effect and I can create a very old looking photograph. Let's try red very quickly. Now, why would I want to do this? Well, there are some cases in which no matter what you do, you may find that your color temperature is off, or there is a very specific emotional look and feel that you want to achieve. This is no different than being able to use a filter um, during the time of photography. And in fact, we like to think that within DxO, it's almost as though we were going back out to the field and recreating that photograph from the ground up. We have that much control. So let's set this back to 100. And hue saturation and light. Here, I have pulled the saturation up a little bit for every color. But I can just as easily say that I want to make the greens more dramatic. I can saturate the greens. I can lighten the greens. And I can shift the hue of the greens. And in some cases, I can create a very powerful image. based upon how I manipulate. You can see the palms there turning various colors. And I can do some measure of color correction this way as well. And now I'm just going to go back to a shot. OK, let's move down. Lens softness. There are really two components here that are very important. One is the ability to control the softness of the image compensate for the softness of the lens. And again, DxO has the ability to do so without damaging or over uh, sharpening the center part of the image, which tends to be the sharper point of the lens. New in 7.0 is bokeh, which adds a very nice effect to the image. And I can pick up the details. I also have the ability here to add a U-sharp mask. And notice, by the way, it now says that the U-sharp mask effect can really not be seen. We don't always use this, but I will remind you that you can add a level of um, sharpness to an image. The U-sharp mask largely adds black. By controlling the extent to which um, I add this. And typically, we find that adding the defaults works well enough. So I'm going to leave it there. Now, noise. Even in an ideal world, there is noise in digital images. It's a fact of life. Um, we particularly find noise in low lighting conditions or when the dynamic range of color, that is the difference between the whitest point and the blackest point, is so great that the camera has trouble enhancing the, the dynamic range of color. So typically, we're going to pull this up, luminescence detail and contrast and chrominescence into at least the 70s, even on a bright day. And in a situation like this, it's probably not going to be much of a problem. But I have the ability also to equalize my gray, remove dead pixels, and remove color moire as well. We're going to do the same thing here. I'm going to increase the sampling, giving DxO the opportunity to choose a larger sample of uh, pixels from which to decide, and I'm going to pull that up a little bit, how to fix my noise. And I'm also going to add purple fringing removal. Now, in this section where it says DxO Film Pack, I have most of the options that were up earlier, um, which gives me the ability to work with the film uh, pack and tailor those um, effects to my expectations. Also new 
which will not have an impact on what we're doing here, is the channel mixer for black and white images. And I'm very quickly going to convert this to black and white. And I'm going to remove the sepia. And you can see uh, the black and white image. And now you can see that I've increased both the red and the yellow. And I've removed some of the magenta in order to get that effect. And if I reset this, you can see particularly in here how the image is changing. So it's a great way to take an existing film type. Note that this is based on the Fuji Neopan. I'm going to also remove this filter so you can get a better idea of what that does. Um, and if I reset all of these, you would see that it will return to a more traditional black and white image. Okay, so let's go back. I'm going to reapply that original preset, and I'm going to move fairly quickly here to do that. Okay, and now I want to be able to fix all of my problems. I want this to stand up straight and square. Actually, let me choose a different preset here. Okay, Red Rock Canyon. By the way, um, we have a naming convention. Let's go back there quickly. Um, NF indicates it was created by us. The dash then labels a particular reason or scenario in which it was created. And then any additional comments that we need to know. So the Botanical Gardens one that I was using, for example, has four permutations. This one was used for a um, a very brown area, and as you can see, it takes a lot of the color out. And similarly, okay. Now, let's go back and let's choose the Red Rock Canyon again. Okay, so how do I fix this visual distortion. What is the most effective way? Well, I have several different options. I can change my horizon. Um, I can, that's this tool here, the horizon tool. I can try to do it with parallel lines. By the way, this is the dust removal tool. We can remove dust on raw images. My cropping tool. And of course, the white eyedropper that we've talked about before. Well, there is a very easy way to do it. Um, I'm going to select the rectangle tool. And as you can see, I now have two windows open. Use the tool on this image, draw a rectangle on the first image, then distort it, and here is what it will look like corrected. I'm going to pull back just a little bit, making the image a tad smaller before I do that. And now I'm going to draw my rectangle. And there it is, one, two, three, and four. I'm going to begin by placing that corner of the rectangle there. Notice my image here moved. I'm going to place that corner there and that corner there. And lastly, I'm going to make some fine adjustments until I'm satisfied that it's reasonably straight. Now, at this point, if I want, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to use my hand tool, which allows me to move the image. And when I switch back to the rectangle tool, I can now make any fine adjustments that I want, which I previously couldn't quite make because I really couldn't see the extent to which um, I was in the position I wanted to be in. That would look good there. And we'll slide across again. Okay, I'm going to move that in just a tad. And let's go check the upper corner. Uh, 
and we'll move that out just a little bit. Now to make sure that I'm happy, I'm going to pull that out. Okay, and now when I deselect that tool, there I am. Now, obviously, if we had more time, we might want to tweak it a little bit more, but all in all, not bad. Notice what's happened. I have, if you follow my cursor or my mouse pointer, I have black areas that indicate areas of the image um, that have been lost by straightening the image. I'm going to come back over to here and I'm going to get the crop tool and I'm going to turn the crop tool on. And again, I've clicked on the down arrow. Now, notice that automatically it's manual and unconstrained. And if I come here under Keystoning and Horizon and again click Watch what happens. By reducing my scale, I've adjusted the image. And if I go to unconstrained, I have the ability to revisit the crop. Notice what it's done here. And I'm going to pull it down. Pull it over. So that now I've retrieved the maximum amount of information very quickly. And now if I deselect the crop tool, there we are. So we went from that to that. And as you can see, it didn't take a terribly um, long period of time to do that. And now if I right click and I choose copy, correction settings, I can highlight my virtual image, my virtual copy that I created earlier, edit and paste. So why is this important? Well, if I've shot the same building from a dozen different angles or the same face of a building a different a dozen I'm sorry, a dozen different ways, I can very simply fix one, copy and paste it on all the other ones. So I can do 100 images this way if I want, simply by um, on the PC, Control A, on the Mac, Option A, right click, paste correction settings, and no matter what the image is like, it will apply those settings across the board. Okay, let's look at another image. We were in Copenhagen at about Christmas time. I'm going to again remove so you can see before and after. Um, the sun was going down very quickly as, as is evidenced by the shadows of the buildings near the Summer Palace. And I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger. And now I'm going to choose a preset. and you can see a very striking image. Now, if I wanted, I can come back up here and I can pull my gamma down a little bit if I want to rich in the colors and darken it a little. I can also increase my shadow ra radius and you can see what's happening. I'm beginning to pull up even more detail. I can pull my global contrast up and my local contrast. Now if I want, I can come to my tone curve and let's say I want to pull my highlights down a little bit. I click on it and as you can see, my histogram will move accordingly. Okay. So, let's move on to another image. And we'll change from architectural images. And for a moment here, I'm going to go back to Organize. And I'm going to go back to the folder. And 
I'm going to see if my photograph of Catherine is here. And there it is. Many of you um, who received the newsletter are familiar with these images. And I'm going to drag them and drop them into the project. And to illustrate the point about why film pack is so important, I'm going to go back and neutralize the image, apply the default. Remember at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about analyzing the technical problems that the image presents to us. Well, this is a case in point. It was very early in my career as a professional. I was still shooting in program mode. Um, hard to believe that a professional would, but I was. And you can see that she's backlit. She is sidelit. You can see the detail in the shoulder is thin. Um, a piece of her face is missing. Powerful image potentially, but simply not there the way it currently is. Um, this was shot. If we go look at the customize and check the EXIF information. With well, a 1DS Mark II with an ISO of 100, um, with a fairly um, long exposure for a model, and the 70 to 200 L series lens with an aperture of 2.8. Now, I'm going to apply the preset that many of you were able to download. And notice, in this case, I also have folders beneath the main folder, and I'm going to go down to the one that says Catherine version 7. Um, quite a difference, I would say. We've retrie retrieved the detail in the dress, again, before and after. Um, we can even see the blood vessels in her shoulder. You can see them there. You can see how we've enhanced the detail. I'm going to move the image. Um, not sure why it paused screen saving there. Okay, I hope we're back. Um, I see the problem. Okay, we should be back. And if I zoom ahead now, you can see how much detail we've restored even in the eye. And let's slide down now. Okay. So in this case, the ability to use a film type can have a very powerful effect. In this case, it's the Agfa Pressica 100. And the original preset that was developed when Film Pack 1 came out I'll show you what that looks like. Um, we need to correct the white balance in this case, but for the most part, you can see that it was a step ahead of what we originally produced, not as good as what we're able to do now. But again, it's a question of every film has its visual properties it's a question of what is it emotionally and technically I want to say. So let's look at another one that was in the newsletter. This is a color over effect. New with version 7, I'm going to slide down so you can see it, is the ability to add a vignette. And as we slide down, I'll expose that option. The defaults here are 50. I've increased the intensity. I've left the midpoint and the roundness in the middle. And my transition is a 12. And if I increase the transition, you can see that it becomes a much sharper line separating my color over from the other area. So I'm going to pull that back down so the transition is much smoother. And similarly, I can make that transition square or round. A very powerful tool 
to create very powerful portraits. Okay, let's look at another one. And I'm going to reset it for you. Okay. There we are. Now, this was a tough portrait. It was shot in the stairwell of an abandoned house. Um, I had to use remotely fired flashes. It was quite a task. So let's work on it a little bit, and then we're going to talk about processing and processing options. Again, I'm going to choose a preset. Okay, uh, not bad, but let's choose another one. Let's do a little HDR. And we're going to go with the ASCII modified. Okay, um, you can see it's much more intense, but her skin is very red. So the first thing I'm going to do is check my color temperature. And you can see that my white balance is 38.54 and my tint is a minus 5. So I'm going to make sure that that's the way they were supposed to be, or that's the way they were when I shot them. So as I showed you before, I went to a shot. Well, the answer is yes. Um, this film also has a very distinctive red to it. And I can correct that. As you can see, the image is changing. by adjusting my hue. Now, I can do this manually, or, of course, I can go to my white, to my eyedropper, pick as close to an 18% gray as I can, or find a spot that creates an image that I think I can work with. And as you can see, it's changing. And that one's not too bad. So we can start there. And notice that my white temperature, my white color temperature rather, is now 3184, and my tint has moved to 29. But there's more I want to do. Um, I want to enhance the shadows around her eyes. I want to be able to bring out more of the emotional power. So my gamma is pretty high here at 6. I'm going to drop it down a little bit. Notice the shadows coming back in her hair. I'm also going to come down to Preserve Shadows, and I'm going to pull that up. And as I pull it up, notice what's happening particularly in here. I'll do that again. I'll take it down to a low number, and now I'm going to pull it up and pull it up a little bit more. And I'm going to increase the shadow radius as well. Drop it back just a little bit, and we've gone from that to that. And now, if I want to increase my saturation to make the image perhaps um, a bit more alive, I can do that. And I can eliminate some of the, some of the contrast. So we've gone from that to that. And let's very quickly look at one more. I won't take you through all the steps since we have about seven to ten minutes left, but that was the way it looked, and that's the way it looked now. Um, the only thing I'm likely to do here to finish this up is probably take a little bit of the contrast, and you can see a very powerful image. So let's talk about file formats. Let's talk about processing. What do I do? once I've adjusted all the photographs. Well, um, that's a very straightforward process, but let me come back to one other point we've had several questions about earlier. I'm going to go back to organize. In previous versions of DXO, starting with 5, um, projects were mandatory. Projects are no longer mandatory. However, we have found that working with large numbers of images, projects make sense. For example, if we shoot the interior of a building and the exterior of a building, we can group together all the external 
and into one project while all the internal are put into another. Or we can put the first floor in one project, the second in another, and so forth. Or we can decide based upon the lighting conditions how we're going to group the images. And it makes processing them quite uh, much, much faster. OK, let's go to process. So what do I do when I'm ready to go? Well, there are a number of options that are available. JPEG, TIFF, which is typically the 16-bit, though here compression for 8-bit is available. Um, under advanced properties, the ability to select an ICC profile can save you a tremendous amount of time. Um, even under custom, you have the ability to create or add your own. 8-bit TIFF, which is typically what we do. And again, the ability to use a specific ICC profile. DNG, for those of you who are a fan of DNGs, those are supported as well. And then we have a number of web and print options that we can use if we wish. And yes, you can create um, your own new output setting if you wish by clicking here. But for the moment, let's close the options we're not using. In this case, I have selected as my destination, same as the original image folder. Or, as you can see here, I can change it to another drive. If your workflow is complex, and ours is, um, this means that we can, we can process images on a remote hard drive. We can save them to yet another hard drive somewhere on our network very quickly. Um, data integrity and backing everything up all the time is really very important. Now, as is the case with everything else in DxO, I have the opportunity um, to save my output any way I want. I can click on any one image and process that image now, if I wish, um, simply by clicking on Start Processing. I can select two images if I wish and click on start processing or I can do control A or option A and start processing or even more, let's go back to the filter option here, I can say I only want to see images that are rated above two stars and you can see now that only the images that have five stars are ready to be processed. Very effective. So even if I haven't worked with a project, I have the ability to distill a project of hundreds of photographs down to a handful that are very effectively processed at this, um, at this particular time because I'm satisfied with all of the options that are available to me. Well, I know this is a lot to get in a very short period of time. I can assure you that even after five years with Optics Pro, every time we think we've mastered everything it has to offer, we have the ability to find some other new tool that has yet to appear or that we've yet to discover. So let's quickly review. It's essentially a three-step process. Organize simply by selecting a folder. And I'm going to shut off again my filter here so that um, everything will show up. Customize and process. And if I have a preset or if I have a collection of settings which I know will work on everything I want, I can do a control A or an option A here where I click and apply my preset, which I'm going to do just to show you very quickly how that will work. And then I can go to process, click on start processing, I'm done. Quick, effective, easy, and straightforward. Now, I don't want to underestimate the amount of complexity that's present in Optics Pro. Um, as we said, it is an amazingly rich tool. But we've always been impressed by the fact that it has the ability to work on multiple levels. You can be as sophisticated, um, as technical, 
as exacting in your use of it as you wish, or you can use it very quickly and very effectively to process a large number of images in a very short period of time. Consistency is very important, and I would strongly urge that as you get to know DxO, you begin to develop your own methodology for how you will process and customize images. Um, again, as I mentioned to you, we typically start with the lighting area, which is one of its most powerful tools, and work our way literally um, down. Well, it's now at the end of the hour. On behalf of the House of Night Falcon and DxO Labs. Okay. Um, can you get me more detail about that? Okay, we have one more question. Okay. Okay, um, let's go back to customize. Um, I will answer this very quickly since time is getting short. If we go back here to camera film and ICC profiles, if I select camera body, all of the camera bodies that I have loaded in my um, selections, you see here I've got a variety of Nikon and Minoltas that I've put in for various cameras that we worked with. If I change that to a D4, it completely, D40, it completely reinterprets all of my information. And you're seeing that happen here in real time. So here's the 1DS. Here's the 1DS Mark II. And the 1DS Mark III or Fuji, etc. Okay, so that's how you do it. Okay, uh, we will be doing two more seminars this week on Thursday, 2 o'clock Eastern Time in the United States and 8 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States. I hope this has been helpful. Um, if you would like further information, we can be reached at info at nightfalcon.com. Knight is spelled N-Y-G-H-T. On behalf of DxO Labs and the House of Knight Falcon, I want to thank you for your participation this evening. I hope it has been helpful, and we look forward to further conversations with you. Good night, happy holidays, and thank you.